Well, I want to say good morning and welcome to Cross Community Church. Welcome to those of you who are at home watching online today. And I want to say a special word of welcome to those of you who are from other churches that are here today. We're fortunate in that we are one of the churches in town that has power. And so blessed to have other people, other representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ uh, around our city here. Now, when I was a kid, uh, my sister tend to outshine me in many things. And sometimes, uh, y'all know what foreshadowing is? It's when an author uh, begins to hint at something early in a story that's going to ultimately come to fruition later. And there's a video that my parents have, I've watched it many times in my life, uh, that was kind of foreshadowing for what was going to happen in our lives. And so um, this was when I was first learning to walk. And so my parents had one of those old school uh, video cameras that kind of had like a yellow tint to everything that it took in, you know. And so uh, they're videoing me here. Here's my big moment, you know, I'm going to take some steps, and they're videoing me, I'm kind of staggering, and, and it, things are going well. I mean, there's things to be proud of. I watch me like, hey, Jason, taking your first steps. Uh, my, my mom and dad cheer me on and celebrating, and then out of nowhere, my older sister, she couldn't take it any longer, she like busted into the this, this scene, like knocks me down, has a microphone, and she starts singing Away in a Manger for the cameras. I like toddle off. You know, I, I was pretty much uh, done at that point, and it's carried on through most of our lives. My sister, brilliant, very successful. She's always been like one of those performers. Now, I, I tell you that story uh, because there is a danger for us as the church of Jesus Christ that we could, in essence, do something similar. Now, we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching us how to live lives as his disciples here on this earth. He was our example, and he's teaching us this is how you should live. And so Jesus has been shining the spotlight into our hearts. Not just avoid murder. Don't just be like, good that you avoid murder. But don't live a life with a heart full of anger and bitterness and unforgiveness. It's great that you avoid adultery. But don't live a life that's dominated by lust and pornography and addiction. And so Jesus has been drawing us to himself, teaching us to look not just to our outward actions, but also into our hearts. Kind of a summary verse for where we've been as Jesus has called us to be salt and light in our world as the church of Jesus, as his disciples here. The summary verse is Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. And he says this, he says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, over the last several weeks, we have talked about the temptation for us as the church to step away from that responsibility, to step away from that high calling, and rather than letting our light shine before men, salt and light in the world, uh, to instead shrink back a bit, to kind of go with the flow in culture, to not stand out, to not uh, be radically devoted to Jesus, but maybe just to kind of go along. And so Jesus warns us against our salt, losing its saltiness, and against hiding our light. We've been walking through that for a few weeks, but now Jesus is going to warn us about another temptation for us. Another thing that we might be tempted to do as his followers, and in so doing, miss the abundant life that Jesus Christ has for us. On the one hand, we're tempted to not shine our light into the darkness, but on the other hand, we might have attempted, we might have a temptation to step into the spotlight ourselves. Look, look at what Jesus says there again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, some of us maybe aren't going to live, pursue that righteous life of love and good deeds. We don't let our light shine. But then there's others of us that we might go ahead and pursue that light, or pursue that life, right? Pursue the righteous life of love and good deeds. But then uh, when it comes time to give glory, we step into the spotlight. We let the light shine on ourselves. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. And Jesus is going to begin warning us about this specific thing. He says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. 
Now, this is not a warning about practicing righteousness, right? Like, we should do that. Jesus has been teaching us how to live or the righteous life as citizens of his kingdom. We're supposed to be salt and light, but beware. In getting caught up and going through the religious motions, we might get caught up in kind of the church culture where we know how to dot the I's and cross the T's. We've got the proper religious phrases. We've learned to say the word just at least 10 times in every single prayer to make us sound uber spiritual. We've, we've adopted some of the king's English into our vernacular. We've got a, a few thuses and thous that we started to say where we begin to outwardly do things not with God as our our audience, but instead to ha- with men as our audience. We're not interceding before the Lord. We're just trying to impress other people. Jesus says, to the church, to my disciples, to those of you who are going to come after me, beware of this temptation to practice your righteousness before men so that you might be seen by them. Because otherwise, You have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Beware, there is a temptation in the church of Jesus for the followers of Jesus Christ who are going to live lives who are different, that become arrogant, that become prideful, and to make it about us. Now, I want you to think about that. If you are here and you're a believer in Jesus today, what is true of you? is that you were a hopeless sinner. You have so messed up your life, and I have so messed up my life. I have sinned so fully and completely before God that there was nothing I could possibly do to earn my way back into his favor. As a matter of fact, I, you and I both, we deserved death because of our sins and eternal separation from God. Right? That's who we are. But then, God, who loved us so much, saw us in our sin and our brokenness, and he sends his son Jesus to die on the cross in our place. Jesus bore the punishment for our sin. He gave us new life in him. Those of us who would come to faith in Jesus, he gave us a new life. He adopted us as his children. He's teaching us how to live, not the broken life of sin that we once knew, where we're dominated by sinful desires and addictions and and past hurts, but instead we get to live the abundant life in Christ Jesus. And how arrogant could it be of us? Rather than saying, hey, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me. Let me tell you how Jesus has changed my life. I once was dead, but I've been made alive again in Christ. How arrogant could we be to say, hey, you know these good works? You know these things I'm doing? I mean, I'm just, it's, it's actually, it's just kind of me. It's kind of who I am. I'm just a really good guy. I'm a good old boy. I'm a good old girl. Hey, check me out. Look how good I am. Now, most of us don't overtly say those things, Right? Let's be honest, like we don't generally come out and say to people, look how good I am. But again, Jesus has been shining his light into our hearts. Saying, don't, don't just look at what comes out of your mouth or the things you do with your hands, but look in your heart. What are those motivations going on in there? And if I'm honest, as I prepared this week, I'm thinking about my own life. So much of what I do is to make sure that I appear acceptable to other people. I say the right things. I pray the right way. I do the right things according to this external religious code that we have, whether we realize it or not. My motivation isn't worship of Jesus. It's really the exaltation of Jason. And so Jesus, in teaching us, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. Now he's going to go on and he's going to give us three examples uh, of of how the Pharisees would practice their righteousness outwardly while inwardly their hearts were all about themselves. They were seeking the praise of men. But he warns us that our reward that otherwise would have come from God, it's been paid in full by the men who are our our audiences. So uh, look with me here in verse 2, and we'll kind of see as Jesus uh, breaks this down. He says, So when you give to the poor, really important note here, 
This is not a first-class conditional statement that says, if you give to the poor. What is assumed about believers in Jesus Christ, what is assumed about the disciples of Jesus, is that the normal course of our lives, we will be giving to the poor. This should be true of you and me. Jesus says, not if you give to the poor, but when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they will have the reward in full. Now, in studying this, there's, it's really hard to break this down, this, the, the whole idea of uh, blowing trumpets in the synagogues or in the streets. And so uh, there's a few theories that have been posited that really we can't find in the historical record exactly what this means. So some people would say uh, that the Pharisees would literally do this. They would go on the street, blow the trumpet, let everybody know, hey, we're going to give out alms, right? We're, gonna, we're giving to the poor. Check me out, right? I'm, this is a big check I'm writing right now. And uh, there's some that suggest that's, that's what happened. Um, and yet, we can't really find much um, attestation historically to that, those events happening. Now, there's another theory uh, that you might read about in a study Bible that in the temple, there was this trumpet-shaped offering box, if you will, and that men would take coins and they would throw them in that trumpet-shaped thing and it would make this really loud sound so everyone would know that they were giving to the poor. Again, there's not a, a whole lot of historical evidence that that is true. What is more likely is this is the Greek version of toot your own horn, if you will. He says, so when you give to the poor, don't toot your own horn. Don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. Now, Jesus just used a really strong word here. Hypocrites? People who give to the poor, and in giving to the poor, they make it about themselves. They're not actually wanting to help other people. They're not wanting to maybe give people a hand up out of their, their situation of poverty or need. Instead, these people who are giving to the poor in this way, they're really trying to exalt themselves. Jesus calls them hypocrites. Now, in the Greek, this word would be used for someone who stood on a stage and acted, a stage actor. Someone who is a totally different person, but when they step on the stage, when people are watching in the crowds, their eyes are on them, they act a particular way, but it's not really who they are. They're just playing a part. They're, they're acting in front of people. I fear, and I, I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, can I just tell you, I, I, I hate that it is, but I believe it's probably true in our church too, that there are some people who might even gather here today, some of you who may be watching online today, that your life is, is kind of like what was just described there. That there's a day a week where you're on stage, if you will, and you put on the smile, you put on the clothes, and you do your religious duty. You, you, you act. You know how to play the part. You've been rehearsing it your whole life. Our southern religious Christian culture, if you will, has taught you that this is how you're supposed to dress and this is how you're supposed to talk and this is what you're supposed to do. But if you're really honest, that's just the part you play on a Sunday. That's just the part you play while you're on stage, while people are looking. You're really a totally different person off stage. And Jesus warns us about this. Because he wants to lead us to the abundant life. The life that where we find full and final satisfaction for our souls. Like Jesus didn't die on the cross so you can pretend for the rest of your life. Jesus died that we might have life and have it to the fullest. He tells us that those of us who would pretend before men to seek their praise... Instead of worshiping before God, that we've received our reward in full. See, what is epidemic, it's, it's true of me, it's probably true of you, is that we're kind of people pleasers, aren't we? We want people to like us. And man, doesn't it feel good when someone pats you on the back and is like, hey, great job, like I saw what you did. And listen, we should be a church, by the way, that encourages like good behaviors. Like we should build one another up. There's plenty in our culture to tear people down. But sometimes those attaboys, those good jobs, they become the thing that we're seeking, right? 
in doing good. We know somebody's watching and we're like, take a little bit longer to drag the wallet out and get our money. And, you know, we kind of broadcast just ever so subtly that we're giving because we want people to build us up. Now, the trouble with people pleasing, the, the, the trouble with kind of trying to act in such a way that people are going to give you praise, is that it's actually idolatry. We're actually worshiping at the altar of ourselves, saying to people, would you praise me? It's about me. It's about how I look. It's about how I appear. And the problem with idolatry is that it leaves us empty. The cry of every single idol in our life, whatever it may be, whether it's money or fame or sex or any other thing, the cry of every single idol in our lives is more. And yes, the praise of men feels good in the moment, but it's fleeting, and it begins to cry out for more. And rather than playing to an audience of God, who alone can satisfy our souls, who alone can bring us and lead us to abundance in Him, we play for an audience of men who can never satisfy us. It's idolatry. The cry is always more praise more acceptance, more encouragement, more fame, more notoriety. It's always more. And how sad would it be if we spent our entire lives as stage actors, playing for the praise of men and receiving our reward in full, but always being empty in our hearts? And so Jesus says, hey, there's, there, there is a real temptation that you would never pursue the righteous life of love and good deeds, that you would never say, here's what the Bible teaches, and begin to live that out in obedience in your life. But there's this, also this temptation that as you begin to pursue the righteous life in Christ Jesus, begin to put one foot in front of the other and follow Jesus as a disciple, there's a temptation that maybe we would start playing for men instead of working on behalf of God. That really our goal would be the praise of men as opposed to the worship of God. And so Jesus warns us. Here's, here's what he says about us in giving. Verse 4, he says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3, he says, But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And so when you think about your earthly rewards, they're temporary they're fleeting, and they don't last, like, not even a few minutes. But the rewards that we get from our Heavenly Father, they satisfy us. They're eternal, lasting rewards that we get in Him, that we get to enjoy for eternity. So Jesus says, when, when you're giving, and you should give, do it in secret. Don't let people know what you're giving. Like, and here's the thing. What Jesus is not telling us to do is be like super secret. Like no one can ever see if I put money in an offering box or a plate. And no one can ever know. But Jesus is saying, hey, I want you to examine the motives of your heart. I want you to, to think about which audience you're playing to. Because that audience is the one that's going to give you your reward. He goes on in verse 5. Now, what he's doing, there were kind of three chief virtues, if you will, uh, among the Jewish community. So the first one was almsgiving or giving to the poor. The second was prayer. And the third was pretty big time in our culture. That was fasting. And so Jesus is going to talk about each of these three things, which we ought to be doing. And he's going to ask us to examine our motives. Verse 5, he talks about prayer. He says, when you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, the, the people who are acting for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they can be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have received the reward in full. Verse 6, but, when you, or, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, I need to be clear. Um, what Jesus is not saying is that we can't gather for corporate prayer. Uh, what what uh, Haley did on the stage just before I got up here, what I'm going to do in just a few minutes. He's not saying you can never pray in front of men. But what Jesus is saying is that your outward presentation, your outward life that you live, when you're praying in public, it ought to match what's happening in private. 
that what shouldn't happen is that you're only praying outwardly for the praise of men to be noticed by other people like the actors, the hypocrites do. That, I mean, you, you see this. I want, I want to continue on before I kind of bring a little more evidence to this. Look, look what he says here in verse 7. He says, And when you're praying, don't use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So don't be like them, for your Father in heaven knows what you need before you ask him. So don't, don't stand up and pray in the, the streets and the synagogues, like calling attention to yourself. Don't use meaningless repetition like the Gentiles do. It's really be, to be noticed. It was kind of a, a, a pagan religion thing where they would have these various chants and they would say them over and over and over and maybe they would get really, really loud because they, they, they thought if I'll say it more times and if I'll, I'll be louder about what I say, then maybe God will hear me. But Jesus in teaching us about what prayer ought to look like reminds us that our Father knows what we pray, like before we even mention the need, he knows. So prayer is something different altogether than trying to persuade God and maybe bend him to our will. But rather prayer is something that is of communion with our Father who is in heaven. Now, a, a few things again. We don't never pray in public. We, don't, we shouldn't worry about the length of our prayers. There were times where Jesus would pray all night. We know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he went back and he repeated prayers. And so what you shouldn't see is a condemnation of, of repeated words in your prayers. You shouldn't see a condemnation of long prayers. And really, you shouldn't see a condemnation of ever praying together in public. But what you should see is a condemnation of praying with men as your audience instead of God. And all the tricks that we might try to play for other people, throwing in a few these and thous, because, you know, you're on like a whole other level of spirituality if you got those in your prayer. You've been around for a while. Can I tell you that this is a struggle for me? That even when I stand up here and I pray, I'm thinking, like, how's this coming across? Like, am I saying all the words that, like, my super educated seminary friends need me to say in order to think that that was a legit prayer and I did it all correctly? And am I communicating in such a way that I don't sound, like, overly pious and churchy and, and like, all these things are going through my head? And can I tell you that there's no freedom and no communion with God in the midst of that? Jesus wants to lead us to life, to genuine communion with our Father who is in heaven. So he says, when you pray, don't get wrapped up in all the things that people might be thinking about, what you might be praying and considering how people may be viewing you. Instead, understand your Father in heaven knows what you need. Communicate with him. We're going to jump down to verse 16. And we're going to take on fasting now. And like I said, even in our culture, a couple thousand years later, Fasting is like the top rung of the ladder for spirituality, right? Now, we, we kind of, we, we can lessen it a bit. We're like, uh, I'm going to fast from social media. I'm going to fast from television, even though I quit watching that a long time ago. I'm going to fast from, but what, what Jesus is talking about here is the full-on, you don't eat fast, right? Like, you don't get anything. You're abstaining for a period of time. I mean, you're, you are denying yourself. And here's the thing. What fasting is, is humbling ourselves before God, Acknowledging God as our provider. We're dependent upon Him to sustain us. We are pleading with God. Like one thing fasting can do is our hunger can remind us to go to God again and again and again in prayer for the thing which might be burdening us at the moment. But look how the Pharisees were treating it. Verse 16, Jesus says, Whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men uh, when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So I don't know if you've ever fasted like straight up, just fasted full on or even for a length of time. Um, it does. It wears on you. You start to physically feel the effects of fasting. The Pharisees, I mean, who wants to waste a good fast? If I'm not eating, I might as well get some credit for it, right? And so they would go out, and rather than practicing normal hygiene, where they would wash their face and they would anoint their, their faces with oil, this is kind of like women putting on makeup. 
only guys did it too. All right, so that's how you would normally go out. You would be presentable. They, they would just hold off like, hey, I'm fasting. They would have this somber look. Like when one of my kids uh, hurts the other one and one comes to tattle. It's like they hurt their wrist, but they're walking with a limp, you know, and it's like, hold on. They want to show something outwardly is going on. That's a little bit of what the Pharisees were doing here. They wanted everyone to know. And again, they got their reward in full from, from people who might for a minute applaud and think they were spiritual, but that was the extent of it. So Jesus is warning us, hey, don't go through life pretending Don't go through life just going through religious motions and really just hoping that people are going to notice you. There is something greater than that. Rather than than being driven by the praises of men, we ought to be driven by worship for God out of gratitude for what He has done for us. When I was a kid, I have a memory of going to a carnival. I couldn't tell you where this carnival was, but I have a very, very vivid memory of what went down. I I was walking through, and welcome, by the way, to eastern Oklahoma. I'm walking through the carnival, and there's a a game where you shoot stuff. And so I'm a kid. I'm a young boy. Obviously, I want to shoot stuff. But more importantly, on the wall as a prize was like a foot-long Bowie knife. If you want to know why we're a little different in the South, it's because we grew up at carnivals where you shot stuff so you could win a foot-long Bowie knife as a seven-year-old kid, right? I mean, we're just turned a little bit differently. And so immediately, I'm drawn in like... I want one of those. Like, I'm going to be the envy of the neighborhood, like a giant. I don't know what I would have done with it, but I needed this giant knife. And so uh, I'm talking to my parents, and they were really gracious. My dad gave me some money, and and I I asked the guy, like, what do I have to do to win one of those knives? And he's like, well, you got to shoot one of these little upright targets. you got to knock it off, and if you'll hit that target, uh, then you get the knife. So here I go shooting and shooting and shooting, and I'm hitting the target, and it's a little pop gun, and and it's it's not knocking it over. I'm like, I've shot it 10 times. Like, what's going on? I didn't didn't know that carnival games are rigged at this point in my life, right? So I I missed one time, and I actually hit another target, so I got like a plastic frog, and I'm like, not what I was going for, you know? So with all the persuasive ability I had, I begged my dad, just one more time, and I shot, and I shot, and I shot, and I shot. And then by some stroke of God's providence, like I don't know how this happened, I hit that target right at the very tip top, and it rocks backwards so hard that when it falls back forward, it falls off the shelf. And so I'm like a teenager on YouTube, like high-fiving people and yelling and getting so excited. I mean, I didn't really do that, but I was. I was so excited, like I've just won the Bowie knife. I'm going to be the envy of all the neighborhood, and it's going to be awesome. And I catch my dad's eye, and he's got one of those tempered looks. I'm like, what's going on here? Like, I got, I just want a knife. Why are we not celebrating? And then I, I, I find out from the guy that I wasn't able to get the knife. I knocked off the target that he told me, if you hit this one, knock it off, you win the knife. But then he goes on to explain to me that I'd knocked it off the wrong way. Welcome to carnival games, right? I didn't know this as a kid. And and what had happened is they put this heavy lead weight on the front side such that it would never tip over backwards so you could never win the knife. I really kind of felt like I was cheated, like it was a rigged game. I should have just taken the knife anyway or something, you know. But I remember walking away dejected. I don't remember if I even finished shooting because you got to shoot until you won a prize. I was just discouraged disappointed, and I didn't want to play the game anymore. Can I submit to you that maybe that would be true of your faith? If you're playing for the praise of men, it feels like a rigged game. You've been going through all the motions, and you hear everybody talking about this great reward that we have in Christ Jesus, this abundant life that's available to us, but I've gone to church my whole life. And I've prayed, and I've read my Bible, and I've done the things, but I haven't got the reward Maybe today I would just want to call your attention to the audience that you've been playing for. Has your life been a life that has been a life of worship to a worthy God, motivated by gratitude for what Jesus Christ has done for you? There's this process that happens with cows. Sorry, I can't help it. I like to talk about cows. Where they eat grass, have a four-chambered stomach, 
And basically it kind of gets churned. It's, it's ruminating in them in order to break the grass down, and it makes it basically something that we could never eat and be worth anything, it turns it into a T-bone steak, right? It's a miracle. Similar things happen when we ruminate on the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we think often about what Jesus has done for us, where we remember that sinful person that we were And that sinful person that we still are, apart from the saving grace of Jesus. Where we get up in the morning and we thank God for the blessings that he has poured out on us. We deserve death. And Jesus paid our debt in full. He demonstrated his love for us. That while we were sinners, where God knew we were going to sin against him over and over and over and over and make it about ourselves and step into the spotlight and Jesus still died to save us. And it's out of the gratitude that comes from a right understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we who have been given so much, we who have been loved so radically, that we begin to pursue the righteous life of love and good deeds before the Lord. It's worship to Him instead of self-seeking for us. Jesus is inviting us to enjoy His abundance. He's teaching us about discipleship and what it means to follow after Him, to live the abundant life that He died to purchase for us on the cross. Yet if you're anything like me, you have a tendency to kind of like my, my sister Push Jesus out of the way, step into the spotlight, look what I can do, look what I've done, and make it about you. So there's only one proper response for us. When we find ourselves in this situation, made it about ourselves, experiencing our reward in full and wondering why God is failing us, when in reality, we're the ones that traded an eternal, abundant, fulfilling, satisfying reward for something temporary and fleeting. And so our proper response is repentance. It's where we acknowledge our sin before God, just confessing it. God, I've made this about me. We acknowledge our sin before God and we turn to our Savior just as we've done time and time and time again. Martin Luther said this about repentance. He said it is a continuing ethic. Many of us think that when we come to faith in Jesus, we repent of our sins and then everything else is happily ever after. But really, this is a walk where we follow after Jesus. Sometimes we stumble. We've got to get back up again. Sometimes we fall flat on our face. Sometimes we find ourselves in the ditch. Sometimes we need other people to help us get up. But the pursuit is of Jesus Christ, walking that narrow path that leads to life. So today for you, if you find yourself in this situation where Maybe you've been running after Jesus, pursuing a righteous life of love and good deeds. But maybe you've been stepping into the spotlight again. Today I want to invite you to repent, to confess that before God and ask Him to transform your heart. That you could think on the gospel and be motivated by gratitude instead of being greedy for your own praise. If you're here today, and maybe you thought that Church, religion was a whole lot like those stage actors. Maybe that's what you've known about Christians. I want you to know that there's a life where your heart can be transformed. Where Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, died on the cross to save you from your sins and to, to invite you to a life which is unlike any other. So in the next few moments, we're going to have a time of response. The band's going to come up and sing. And the invitation for you is to do business with God. Maybe you just need to worship as you remember the gospel and what Jesus Christ has done for you. Maybe today is a day of repentance where you acknowledge your sin before him and you ask him to transform your heart. And maybe for you as you sit here today, today is the day that you surrender your life to Jesus. You say, you know, I've been trying to live this life on my own. It's been empty. And you cry out to God to save you and give you a new life. Would you bow with me? Father, We praise you for your unending patience with us. 
God, even in the midst of our attempted worship, sometimes we make it about ourselves. We want to be noticed by men. Father, we thank you for the cross, for the gospel to which we constantly return. We remind ourselves day after day after day of the goodness of God on our behalf. Lord, I pray that this would be a church of disciples, of men and women who follow hard after you. God, would you use us for your glory? And may we do these good deeds. Let our light so shine before men that they see our good deeds and may glorify our Father who is in heaven. Father, may you be glorified in us. May you be glorified in the church across LaFleur County. May you be glorified in your church around the world. And we pray this in the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen.